Hi everyone, this is Max Lucado's book. You'll get through this. I'm reading chapter 12. The prince is your brother. You've never seen a scene like this. The basketball player stands at the free throw line. His team is down by one point. Only a few seconds remain on the game clock. Players on both teams crouch, ready to grab the rebound. The shooter positions the ball in his hand. The crowd is quiet. The cheerleaders gulp. Again, you've never seen a scene like this. How can I be so sure? Because a player shooting the ball has never seen a scene like this. He's blind. Everyone else on his team is sighted. Everyone on the other team is sighted. But Matt Steven, a high school senior in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, can't see a thing. His brother stands under the rim, wrapping a cane on the basket. Matt listens, dribbles, and lifts the ball to shoot. We wonder why does a basketball coach place a blind kid on the foul line? The short answer? Because he is Matt's big brother. The long answer began years earlier when Matt was born with two permanently detached retinas. He lost his left eye in the fifth grade and his right eye in the sixth. But even though Matt can't see, his big brother has enough vision for them both. Joe spent a childhood helping Matt do the impossible. Ride a bike, ice skate, and play soccer. So when Joe began coaching the basketball team, he brought his baby brother with him as the equipment manager. Matt never practices or plays with the team, but with Joe's help, he shoots free throws after every practice. Long after the team leaves, the brothers linger, the younger one at the charity line, the older one beneath the basket, tapping a stick against the rim. So it is that Matt, for this tournament game, is the designated free throw shooter. Joe convinced the reps and the opponents to let Matt play. Everyone thought it was a great idea, but no one imagined the game would come down to the shot. So far, Matt is 0 for 6. The gym falls silent. Joe hits the iron rim of the basket with the cane. Up in the stands, Matt's mom tries to study the video camera. Matt dribbles, pauses, and shoots. Swish! The game is tied. The screams of the fans lift the roof of the gymnasium. Finally, the crowd settles down so Matt can hear the click. And the scene never seen repeats itself. Swish number two. The opposing team grabs the ball and throws a Hail Mary at the other basket and misses. The game is over and Matt is the hero. Everyone whoops and hollers while Matt, the hero, tries to find his way to the bench. Guess who comes to help him? You got it. Joe, big brother can make all the difference. Got bullies on your block? Big brother can protect you. Forgot your lunch money? Big brother has some extra. Can't keep your balance on your bike? He'll steady you. Call your big brother. Big brother, bigger than you, stronger, wiser. Big brother, since he is family, you are his priority. He has one job, to get you through things. Through the neighborhood, without getting lost. Through the math quiz, without failing. Through the shopping mall, without stopping. Big brothers walk us through the rough patches of life. Need one? You aren't trying to make a basket, but you are trying to make a living or make a friend or make sense out of the bad breaks you've been getting. Could you use the protection of a strong sibling? The sons of Jacob certainly needed it. it as they stood before Joseph, they were the picture of pity, accused of stealing the silver cup, tongue-tied goat herders before a superpower sovereign. Nothing to offer but prayers, nothing to request but help. Judah told the prince their story, how their father was frail and old, how one son had perished, and how also losing Benjamin would surely kill their father. Judah even offered to stay in Benjamin's place if that was what it would take to save his family. They were face first on the floor, hoping for mercy, but they received much more. Joseph told the officials to clear out, his translators to leave the room. Then Joseph could not restrain his help. Genesis 45 verse 1 He buried his face in his hands and began to heave with emotion. He didn't weep gently or whimper softly. He wailed. The cries echoed in the palace hallways, cathartic, cathartic moans of a man in a moment of deep healing. Twenty-two years of tears and trickery had come to an end. Anger and love had dueled it out. Love had won. He broke the news. I am Joseph. Does my father still live? Eleven throats gulped and twenty-two eyes whined the sound of so to the size of saucers. The brothers still in a deep genuflex sorry, I don't know how to read it, dared not move. They ventured glances at each other and mouthed the same name. Joseph, their last memory of their younger brother was a pale faced, frightened lad being carted off to Egypt. They had counted their coins and washed their hands of the boy. 
He was a teenager then. He was a prince now. They lifted their heads ever so slightly. Joseph lowered his hands. His makeup was still smeared and his chin still quivered. His voice shook as he spoke. Please come near me. They rose to their feet, slowly, cautiously. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Joseph told them not to fear. God sent me here. God did this. God is protecting you. In today's language, there's more to our story that meets the eye. Their brothers were still not sure who this man was. This man who wept for them, called for them, and then cared for them. Fetch your family, he instructed, and come to Egypt. He promised to provide for them and seal their promise with even more tears. He stood from his chair and threw his arms around his baby brother. He fell on his brother Benjamin's wet neck and wept. He kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. One by one he received them, Judah, the one who came up with the slave trafficking idea, Reuben, the firstborn, who didn't always behave like a big brother, Simeon and Levi, who wrought such violence at Shechem that their father deemed them instruments of cruelty. Those who had tied his hands and mocked his cries, he kissed them all. Hostility and anger melted onto the marble floor. Joseph didn't talk at them or over them. They just talked. How's dad? Reuben, you're looking chubby. Simeon, how's your health? Levi, did you ever marry that girl from across the field? Have any kids? Any grandkids? When Pharaoh heard about Joseph's siblings, Pharaoh told him, any family of yours is a family of mine. And the next thing you know, Joseph was outfitting his brothers in new clothes and carts. They were honorary citizens of Egypt. Outcasts one moment, people of privilege the next. At about this point, the brothers began to realize they were out of danger. The famine still raged. The fields still begged. Circumstances were still hostile. But they were finally safe. They would make it through this because they were good men? No, because they were family. The prince was their brother. Oh, for such a gift. We know the fill of a famine. Like the brothers of Joseph, we've found ourselves in dry seasons. Resources gone, supplies depleted, energy expired. We've stood where the brothers stood. We've done what the brothers did. We've hurt the people we love. Sold them into slavery? Maybe not. But lost our temper? Misplaced our priorities? You bet. Like the shepherds of Beersheba, we've sought help from the prince, our prince. We've offered our prayers and pleaded our cases. We've wondered if he would have a place for the likes of us. What the brothers found in Joseph's court, we find Jesus Christ. We find in Jesus Christ. The prince is our brother. In this, is this a new thought for you? You've heard Jesus describe a king, savior, and lord, but brother... This is biblical language. On one occasion, Jesus was speaking to his followers when his family tried to get his attention. His mother and brother stood outside and sent word that they wanted to speak to him. Jesus took advantage of the moment to make a tender gesture and statement. He stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew 12 verse 49 to 50 had you and I been pres present that day, we would have looked at the family of Jesus and seen little to impress us. None of his followers was of noble birth, no deep pockets or blue blood. Peter had his swagger, John had his temper, Matthew had his checkered past and colorful friends. Like Jacob's sons in the Egyptian court, they seemed outclassed and out of place. Yet Jesus was not embarrassed to call them his family. He laid his claim to them in public. He lays claim to us as well. Jesus, who makes people holy, and those who are made holy are from the same family. So he's not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2 verse 11. Jesus redivined his family to include all who come near him. The account of Joseph is simply an appetizer for the Bible's main course, the story of Jesus. So many similarities exist between the two men. Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob. Jesus was the beloved Son of God, Matthew 3, verse 17. Joseph wore the coat of many colors. Jesus did the deeds of many wonders. Joseph fed the nations. Jesus fed the multitudes. Joseph prepared his people for the coming famine. Jesus came to prepare his people for eternity. Under Joseph's administration, grain increased. In Jesus' hand, water became the finest wine, and a basket of bread became a buffet for thousands. Joseph responded to a crisis of nature. Jesus responded to one crisis after another. 
He told typhoons to settle down and waves to be quiet. He commanded cadavers to stand up, the crippled to dance a jig, and the mute to sing an anthem. And people hated him for it. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, Jesus for 30. Joseph was falsely accused and thrown into prison. Jesus was condemned for no cause and nailed to a cross. The brothers thought they had seen the last of Joseph. The soldiers sealed the tomb, thinking the same about Jesus. But Joseph resurfaced as a prince, so did Jesus. While his killers slept and followers wept, Jesus stood up from the slab of death and wrapped his burial clothes and stepped out into the Sunday morning sunrise. God gave Jesus what Pharaoh gave Joseph, a promotion to the highest place. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power except from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. Ephesians 1 verse 20 to 22. This is where the similarities cease. Joseph's reign and life eventually ended, but Jesus, heaven will never see an empty throne. Jesus occupies it at this very moment. He creates weather patterns, redirects calendars, and recycles calamities, all with the goal of creating moments like this one in which we, his undeserving family, can hear him say, I am Jesus, your brother. He whips at the very side of you, not tears of shame, but tears of joy. He calls for you, come to me, all of you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. One foot of distance is too much. He wants us to come near, all of us, we who threw him into the pit, we who sold him out for silver, we who buried the very memory of our deeds. Come, come, come. He cares for you. Joseph spoke to his king, and Jesus speaks to ours. In him, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2 verse 1 Joseph gave his brothers wagons and robes. Your brother promises to supply all your need according to his riches. Philippians 4 verse 19. Let's trust him to take care of us. God is doing in our generation what he did in ancient Egypt, redeeming a remnant of people. In his final book, God reiterates his vision. A great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Revelation 7 verse 9 to 10 This dream drives the heart of God. His purpose from all eternity is to prepare a family to indwell the kingdom of God. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 Oh, the beauty of the thrice-repeated word plants. God is plotting for good. In all the setbacks and slip-ups, He is ordaining the best for a future. Every event of our days is designed to draw us toward our God and our destiny. To the, to, uh, to the degree that we believe and accept His vision for our lives, He will get through life. When people junk us into the pit, we will stand up. God can use this for good. When family members sell us out, we will climb to our feet. God will recycle this pain. Falsely accused, wrongly imprisoned, utterly abandoned, we may stumble, but we do not fall. Why? God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Ephesians 1 verse 11 Everything means everything. No exceptions. Everything in your life is leading to a climactic moment in which Jesus will reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Colossians 1 verse 20 At the right time, in God's timing, you will be taken home to Canaan. But till then, stay close to your brother. After Matt Stevens made the foul shots, he became the hero of his high school. Everyone wanted to meet him. Cheerleaders wanted to talk to him. It was reported that he was thinking about asking a girl to the prom. Wonderful things happen when a big brother helps out. You will get through this, not because you are strong, but because your brother is. Not because you are good, but because your brother is. Not because you are big, but because your brother is. The prince and yes, a place prepared for you. Amen. Mm -hmm.